Hello and welcome into BTN's Take 10 Podcast. This is Alex Rue of BTN.com. And with last weekend's Big Ten Championship game in the rearview mirror, with Ohio State defeating Northwestern, and the Big Ten ultimately being left out of the college football playoff, we're going to turn our attention to basketball a little more as we wait for the bowl games to get underway. And there's plenty of Big Ten basketball to watch this time of year, especially with the early season conference games in their second year with the Big Ten playing two conference games in early December. Uh, it's been a lot of fun to watch, a lot of close games, and uh, like I said, plenty of hoops to talk about. So we're going to talk college hoops on this episode of the Take 10 Podcast, and we're actually going to talk about the history of college hoops because our guest on this week's episode has been around the game for a long time, was a coach at Rutgers, and was an assistant and a head coach all over the country before becoming a broadcaster for the last couple of decades. Um, and it, like I said, it's been all around the sport. So that guest is Bob Wenzel. As I mentioned, he was the head coach at Rutgers. He was there in the late 1980s or 1990s. and was actually the last coach to take the Scarlet Knights to the NCAA tournament. And he got there twice at Rutgers. He was an assistant at Duke before that, head coach at Jacksonville University before that, where he took JU to the NCAA tournament as well. And then he got into broadcasting, calling NCAA tournament games for CBS, calling uh, tons of college basketball, including for us here at BTN, where he uh, still does call games to this day. So Bob gave me uh, plenty of time, about 40 minutes of of great college basketball talk. He's, uh, like I said, been around the game a long time. His mentor was Jim Valvano, so we talked some Jimmy V. Definitely talk a lot of Rutgers hoops, both past and present. And uh, we get into some really cool stories that if you know, you're know a fan of college basketball, like I am, I think you'll really enjoy. So we'll get to that interview with Bob in just a moment. There is no stat head segment with BTN researcher Harold Shelton this week. He's getting a much-deserved vacation. I think he's on vacation. I'll have to check up with him next week. But he's, he's off this week. And after a long uh, month of November with college football and basketball overlapping and a long college football season 14 weeks in a row uh like i said it's well deserved for him so bob is coming up for about 40 minutes here in just a moment but first i want to tell you about an opportunity from our sponsor the northwestern university school of professional studies and uh a a very cool program for people who might be interested in working in sports whether that's at a place like big 10 network or somewhere else in the industry You can build a solid foundation in the strategic, creative, and analytic skills that are essential for success in the business of sports in the master's program in sports administration at Northwestern University. Find out more at sps.northwestern.edu slash sports. All right, like I said, check that out. It's a great opportunity. And now we'll get to our interview with Bob Wenzel. As I mentioned at the top, he's a former longtime college basketball coach, head coach at Rutgers most recently, and he's the last team to take the Scarlet Knights to the NCAA tournament. So let's get to that interview right now with BTN analyst, longtime college basketball analyst and former college coach, Bob Wenzel. I'm very pleased to be joined by a former basketball coach who was the head coach at Rutgers in the 80s and 90s. He's currently a college basketball analyst and has called games for BTN, among several other outlets. It's Bob Wenzel. Bob, good afternoon. Thanks for joining me. Hey, How's Alex. it going? Nice to uh, meet you over the phone. Yeah, great to meet you. Great to talk with you. I appreciate you giving me some time today, and uh, we got plenty to talk about because you have a uh, very lengthy history in the sport of basketball, uh, both on the media side and the coaching side. So, you know, those familiar with you, especially maybe the younger audience, maybe know you more as a basketball analyst and aren't as familiar with your coaching pedigree. So Rutgers fans obviously remember you as, as the last coach to take the Scarlet Knights to the NCAA tournament. But if you could, could you run through your stops in the coaching career and your experience around the game before you transitioned to a broadcast career? Sure, Alex. Uh, you know, I played at Rutgers also, and uh, I was drafted to the ABA. There was a, two professional leagues at that time, and eventually uh, six or seven of those teams merged into the NBA. And then when I got cut, uh, my college coach, Bill Foster, had moved to the University of Utah. So he asked me to come out there, and I did. And I became a graduate assistant and learned about the West and learned how to snow ski and, and learned how to recruit California and um, had a grand old time out there. Uh, 
And then um, I, when he went to Duke, uh, I joined him at Duke. So I was an assistant at Duke for six years. And at the time, Duke had been bad for several years in a row. And uh, we came in and really turned the program around and, uh, you know, got to the final two uh, in 1978 in Kentucky with Jack Givens uh, beat us in the finals. And uh, disappointingly, the two years after that, we were ranked number one in the nation and didn't make it back to the final four. So when I'm broadcasting, I really know, um, have some personal experience with coaching in the final four and then being disappointed of not making it in the final four. Sometimes you, you think maybe you had a better team, uh, but circumstances happen and different things go on. And, and uh, so you cherish every moment actually is, is what it gets down to that you learn from, from that experience. Uh, and then I became the head coach of Jacksonville university and we were a top 20 team NCAA tournament. A lot of guys went to the NBA, a lot of good athletes, uh, Otis Smith became the uh, a good player in the NBA, and then the general manager of the Orlando Magic, and several other guys. You know, had good careers. Uh, and then I, I coached in the NBA with the New Jersey Nets. Uh, but then Rutgers came calling, and it was my alma mater, and they were seven and twenty-two, three years in a row, something like that. And uh, so I took that job. And at the time, we had the biggest turnaround in the history of college basketball. It went from a you know, seven win team. To, we made the NCAA tournament my first year. And uh, so I had a pretty good run at Rutgers. And then, you know, uh, we went through a lot of different uh, things with uh, the changing of we were in the Atlantic 10 at that time. And we were trying to get into the Big East. And uh, we went in uh, the Big East as a football team, not a basketball team. And then finally, we did get in uh, the Big East. And then finally, you know, I ran out of steam there and uh, got out of coaching and got into the broadcast business. Yeah, so I want to get deeper into Rutgers in, in just a little bit here. But first, I want to touch on some of those stops you mentioned. Obviously, Duke, uh, you mentioned Duke was bad, which which for someone my age is incomprehensible, inconceivable. <laughs> um, so let's start at your stop at Duke. You were a Duke assistant, looks like, until 1980, and that was when – Coach K, Mike Krzyzewski, was hired and has been there ever right. since. So were you a candidate for that job, and uh, could the college basketball landscape look different if you if you had gotten hired there? Yeah, Duke wouldn't have been as good. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, I was a candidate, and um, I, I was 29 years old at the time, and um, I, I thought I had a pretty good shot at it. And uh, Mike, uh, Coach Krzyzewski, was at Army and hadn't done much there. Um, you know, he was head coach. And um, but Bob Knight was a big influence in college basketball back in those days. And uh, Tom Butters, who's the athletic director at Duke, relied on his opinion because he knew him. And uh, Bob, of course, was right about it. And Mike Krzyzewski has done tremendous, obviously, you know, best maybe other than John Wooden, the best coach ever in college basketball. And, uh, but yes, they interviewed me. I had a pretty good shot at it, uh, but it didn't work out. And it, it certainly worked out the best for Duke. All right, let's move on now to your time at Jacksonville, a program that you had uh, humming pretty good. And one note when I was doing some research on you that I found really interesting was you got a hold of Dean Smith, the legendary North Carolina coach, and his number one ranked North Carolina team actually played a road game at JU as kind of a favor to you. And I feel like that rarely, if ever, happens these days. So how did that arrangement come about? Well, that's very interesting that you uh, saw that, and I'll tell you a story about it. I called Dean Smith up, and I knew him, of course, because I was at Duke, and I had the utmost respect for him, one of my favorite coaches ever, and um, brilliant, brilliant person. Um, and I called him up and said, hey, coach, you know, I, I know this is asking a lot, but um, we – they, they get nobody at the games here and it's down and we're trying to build it back up and you're such a big name and North Carolina is such a big name. I'd love to play. And he said, well, I'd be happy to have you come to Chapel Hill. <laughs> so I said, well, that's not exactly what I had in mind, but certainly uh, I would do that. Uh, but, you know, the idea is for you to come here and people will come to watch you and maybe fall in love with our team. And, you know, we'll be working hard at it and so on. And he said, well, I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll play a three-game series. I said, great. He said, we'll play one game in Chapel Hill, and then we'll play one game in Jacksonville, and then we'll play one game in neutral site. So I'm thinking neutral site, you know, between Jacksonville and 
Chapel Hill, maybe Savannah or Charleston, something like that. And I, I said, well, where's the neutral site? He said, Greensboro. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, we had a, he was, for him to do that, even at that time, was very unusual. And I was, I'll be eternally grateful uh, to him and his, his legacy about um, being such a gentleman. And uh, it was great for us because they were number one in the nation and he beat us by three. We almost beat him at our place. And then um, we almost beat them in Greensboro, tight game. They were fourth or fifth in the country. And then in Chapel Hill, they blew us out. Uh, so we lost all three games, but gained a lot for the program and for the notoriety and for recruiting and, you know, fans and, you know, excitement and all that. So um, it, was, it was something that was very, very good for our, our program. Yeah, you're not supposed to do that. You're not supposed to challenge the uh, number one team in the country when they come <laughs> do you a favor. <laughs> that's right I, but i didn't apologize afterward i can tell you that much nor should you all right bob <laughs> uh another question about your time at jacksonville um one of the main i guess incidents that pops up when you when you search your background is a brain aneurysm you suffered uh on the sidelines while coaching in, in 1986 during a game so if you don't mind would you be able to reflect on that experience and uh your obviously progression from from that point Sure. Uh, it, I, we were, I was coaching, as you said, and um, I, I, I was kneeling down. When I got up, I felt like somebody hit me with a sledgehammer in the head. And uh, I finished coaching the game, and, and uh, I was very sick and vomiting and everything after the game. And um, my wife uh, called our team doctor, and he said, rush him to the hospital right now. And he knew what it was. Uh, and there and they rushed me into the emergency room and um you know they they took a blood sample this is how they test for this i guess they take a blood sample out of your spine and it should be clear fluid and it was bloody um uh, you know a a a sample so uh they determined what was wrong and they kept me uh sedated for several days until all the blood drained out of my uh head cavity uh so they, they can do the operation, you know, they cut a hole in your head and they go in there and they put a clip on, it's like a flat tire thing, you know, um, so they put a clip on it and, um, yeah, so it, it uh, and I survived and it was an eight hour surgery and, uh, you know, it was, uh, I was very blessed and a lot of people who get this don't make it and uh, so, uh, yeah, yeah, it was a long time ago and I have no ill you know, some people have ill effects from it. You know, they get paralyzed on one side or something like that. And I'm now in the club of form your form, former aneurysm. And you run it to people sometimes who have, and then, you know, we talk about it and uh, compare notes and so on. But uh, yeah, so I survived it well. And, and the next year um, I came back and, um, you know, uh, after I was out there back in the public eye again, somebody asked me about it and I, uh, because we went to the NCAA tournament the following year uh, with my Jacksonville team. And he said, yeah, were there any reflections about the aneurysm? I said, well, really, it wasn't an aneurysm. It was a John Wooden implant. Uh, <laughs> so we joked about how our team got better after that. Uh, so uh, but it was uh, obviously a harrowing experience and uh you know, I had one child at the time and I had three, I have three now. And, um, you know, not the thought of not seeing, uh, them grow up would have been, you know, devastating. So, uh, yeah, but it turned out great, you know, and I had good doctors and a good wife and good family. And, you know, it's, uh, it's, uh, I was blessed. Yeah, definitely a scary situation and awesome that you made it obviously, and don't suffer any, uh, ill effects from it to this day. That's great. Um, and, like you said, you kept coaching and eventually ended up at Rutgers. And, you know, with a program like Rutgers, it's obviously a, a program that struggles to maintain consistent success. So how did you get that program up and running once you left Jacksonville and in uh, and the, and the Nets? So everything from, like, the fan support to the product on the court, how did you get that program eventually to an NCAA tournament? I did one thing that was very similar to the Dean Smith, the North Carolina thing. I called Jim Beheim and – asked him to do the same thing as I did with coach Smith and he agreed to that. And, um, and I think he agreed to it because he didn't think of us as, as much of a threat. And it was just a one for one thing. Um, and 
that was great too because you know anytime Syracuse plays an away game, they lose a lot of revenue, right? Because you know they they have the Carrier Dome, so anytime they have a home game, uh, you know they're drawing twenty thousand at minimum. So you know those are big numbers uh, for income. So for them to play an away game was a big deal for us and. Uh, you know, the first year I, I had experience with the three point shot because in Jacksonville in our league, we experimented with it for, for a few years. You know, the, the NCAA allows you to do that. So we were very familiar with the three point shot. So when I got to Rutgers, we had, you know, there, there weren't that many good athletes on the team and they were seven and 22, three years in a row. And, um, so I said, okay, we're going to press and shoot threes and try to create excitement and try to get people to come to the games because, you know, the attendance was poor. Uh, and we started doing that and we caught fire the first, you know, at the middle of my first year. And we had several players who could really shoot it from deep. And uh, we took advantage of the three. And I think we're fortunately a little ahead of the curve with that. And, um, you know, we pressed and ran and shot threes and people came to the games and we had sellouts and, you know, we scheduled up outside of the league. You know, we played UNLV and Missouri was number one in the nation at the time. And um, it was funny because at, at that time, not everybody was on television so much that television was limited, but getting on television was key and nobody wanted to put us on, put Rutgers on. So I went to all these uh, network people in New York and begged to get on and they said no 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 and then uh they called me one day out of the blue and they said hey we have a game for you i said great um what is it he said at unlv now this is the unlv team that beat duke by 40 right um so no one would play them <laughs> so we did and uh I, I think they took the game off about you know 12 minutes in because we were getting slaughtered so badly um but part of the deal was they had to come back the next year to play at Rutgers and they did and we beat them at Rutgers so they weren't you know as high powered but they were still like I don't know 8th or 12th in the country or something like that and uh, Tarkanian was the coach and so uh, you know those kinds of things built it up and created excitement and uh, you know we had players that were better than people thought they were and and with Syracuse we got a couple of transfers and um, you know two from Syracuse that were outstanding players and uh, they really helped after the second year, you know, they had to sit out in, in the third, fourth, fifth year. Um, you know, they helped a great deal. Yeah. You seem like a savvy marketer. Obviously you knew how to get fans excited. You knew how to get your program exposure. And another note that I, I saw when looking into your background was at Rutgers, you went around campus trying to recruit students and really uh, were aggressive with them, getting them to the game. So you see stories these days now still about guys like Tom Crean doing this at a school that's not traditionally a basketball school and uh, yeah. other, other non-traditional basketball schools. What was that like trying to energize the student body? Uh, it, it was really fortunate because we had such success early. Um, but when I went out before the game started during the fall, um, you know, a few kids would show up at some places and then – you know, I, I had sort of an act, you know, Jim Valvano was my mentor in, in coaching. He was my freshman coach when I played. And uh, I certainly didn't have the dynamic personality that he had, but I had, was pretty good at speaking and entertaining people, you know, with basketball stories and so on. And it got around. So, um, you know, after a while it built up. And then when we were winning, you know, it became a big deal. And uh, that was, that was, uh, it's interesting you brought that up because it's very vital to have that. And you see that at all the big 10 schools, they all have, you know, great, great student support. And, um, you know, that's very, very important. And, um, when that happened, uh, the excitement's there, the noise is there, the band is there and, uh, the whole atmosphere becomes electric, um, when the students get involved like that. So, uh, but we had to work again there, right. You know, and uh, it wasn't just going to happen. So we had to do something to make it happen and along with some players who were the kids could relate to the students could relate to that played way way better than they thought um all of that sort of came together to provide you know some good attendance and good excitement i'm glad you brought up jim valvano with it uh, being that time of year you know jimmy v week where yes. his face and his speech is everywhere uh, in the fight against cancer and uh his effort to raise money Does this time of year ever you know mean more to you just because he's he is so 
present, front facing, uh, still to this day, and with him being your mentor? Does it uh, well, get, get to I, you? I, I, well, uh, I don't want to put too much into that because um, he, he's such a universal uh, character, person, personality uh, that I certainly don't want to take ownership of any of that, you know? Um, and uh, But for me, uh, you know, he was controversial, too, during the course of the later part of his coaching career. And sure. um, so I, I like to think of all of the uh, times uh, when he was just coaching us kids. He was only a few years older than us, you know, and uh, and during the times where I would call him up and say, well, how do you do this and how do you do that? And, you know, when the team's way better than you, how do you, you know, and he said, talk to me about the training, slowing all down and. I don't know if you remember this, but, um, you know, they're playing when he was at NC State, they're playing uh, by Slamma Jamma was the, the nickname of the Houston team that had Clyde Drexler and Akeem Olajuwon and all those guys. And so the night before the finals, there's always a banquet at the final four and the coaches speak. And Jim said, uh, he got up and he was talking and he, and, uh, he said, well, you know, we're, we're playing Phi Slamma Jamma. And he said, we have a, a fraternity at North Carolina State, too. And it's called Gonna Hold the Balla. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and of course, they didn't hold the ball. But he became famous in that game because of the use of fouling. Uh, at the end of the game, you know, and uh, even went ahead. They fouled because Houston was a poor free throw shooting team and they would go to the line and miss the front end of a one and one and then NC State would, would have an extra possession. So, um, but anyway, it, it, it is a special time of the year for sure. Yes. And um, he was uh, an unbelievable personality and, um, you know, we had a good relationship. Yeah, <clears throat> that documentary about the 82 championship game is one of my favorites. Just seeing, one, the Five Slamma Jamma, the athletes they had, but then seeing Jimmy V kind of outside of that SB speech where most people recognize him. Um, yeah. So I want to move on uh, past your coaching career, uh, past your time at Rutgers. Obviously had great success there, made two NCAA tournaments, and they have not been back since. So what kind of facilitated your move to broadcasting? Why did you decide to – leave coaching and how'd you get into the business well most coaches you know uh at that level they have their own television shows they're exposed to the media a lot so you're comfortable in front of a camera and so on uh so i called up cbs and and said hey i'm interested in getting into this and then i called up espn said i'm interested in getting into this so the guy from cbs um he said well come in tomorrow i said what are you talking about he said, well, tomorrow is, uh, you know, we have two championship games. This was, you know, in March. Um, and we had the SEC and we have, I can't remember exactly what it was. And he said, uh, Pat O'Brien was the uh, the host. And I think Quinn Buckner and uh, somebody else were the, uh, the guys who were the analysts. And he said, well, I want you to watch the games. And then when, when there's a commercial or halftime, I want you to just tell Pat O'Brien what's going on. Now, uh, I said, well, what do you mean? He, he said, well, just tell him he has a photographic memory. I said, you're kidding. He said, no, no, he, he doesn't know much about basketball, but he, he will listen to what you say and he will say those exact words <laughs> when he, they come on the air. So I thought this is fascinating. So I'm watching the games, not on the air, but just in the background and I'm telling him what's going on in this game, in this game. And it was really cool. Um, so I'm getting my coat on to leave and get on the train to go back to New Brunswick, where I live. And um, the guy says, well, um, aren't you going to stick around? I said, well, what do you mean? He says, we have the selection show now. I said, you're kidding. He said, no, no, no. Um, here's what I want you to do. He said, we get the, the pairings and the sites and everything. 20 minutes before we have to go on the air. So we need everybody's eyes and ears on these uh, matchups. And when when we get the matchups, you will get the sheet. And I want you to look through it and just see what you see and, and tell us what you see on here. If there's an interesting matchup, if there's a zone versus a man thing, if there's games that have been played before that might impact this, if, if, if there are superstar coaches playing again, you know, just, just brainstorm. And I said, wow, yeah, well, that's great. So now I get by myself, and Alex, I'm thinking all these years I've coached, 
you know, I'm waiting to see if my team's getting in. And, you know, those shots of the coach in the living room with his players, you know, wondering whether they're going to get in or what their seat is. And, and I said, I'm holding this. The whole world, <laughs> the basketball world, wants to know this. And I got it right here. Um, so that was pretty cool. And, uh, so I did that. And uh, so that was the start. You know, I think I made a favorable impression on them. And then the ESPN people uh, were in Charlotte. There was ESPN regional television who had the rights, a lot of the rights to the Big East. And uh, so they said, okay, come on down. Uh, we're going to have you do a game off of a monitor. And the game is going to be the Villanova-Syracuse game that happened this past year. And uh, you come down, and we have a play-by-play guy for the uh, for the NBA team here, and you guys, two guys, will do the game. And uh, so then I called up everybody I knew on television. And I said, "How do you do this? <laughs> How do you do the research? How do you do the you know what are storyboards and you know all these sort of things that you need as an announcer?" And uh, so I did well enough to get hired, and uh, they gave me games, and it you know it blossomed from there. And then of course. You know, as as the, uh, the the landscape has changed in the television, sports television world, you end up working for different entities and so on. And uh, so that's, yeah, that's how it got started, just by trying to be aggressive and call up and say that you were interested. So what was the biggest learning curve you had approaching the game from that side of the aisle? Well, you know, it's, it's one thing is you have friends uh, in the business and you have teams that you maybe don't like uh or uh, in the business and you uh, well, i was never doing just one team right you know I, it was just uh, it was always right down the middle 50 50 you know i'm doing rutgers against somebody i'm doing duke against somebody i'm doing you know and you can't let your uh, feelings about or your past experiences at, at places uh color the way you you call uh the game uh, so that was one thing. And then another thing is, you know, how to do all the research and, and where do you keep these ideas? And, you know, we have a thing called storyboards. And on one side, you have one team. And on the other side, you have the other team. And how you organize the players, their numbers, their statistics, the stories about them uh, is very vital to doing it correctly, uh, or doing it well in an entertaining way. Um, because if you don't do that research, I feel like if I don't do the research, if somebody sends it to me, I don't really know it. Uh, so, um, doing that whole process of, of, uh, researching the teams, following the teams, it's easier now because, you know, the internet is so great and, you know, the websites are great and scores, you can get them in a second, wherever you are, uh, box scores, you can read, you know, we read them, I read them every day. Um, so there's, um, those are things that I had to learn about. And there were people like Dick Enberg, who was a mentor to me in, in uh, this business. And um, UB Brown was, was a guy who taught me a lot uh, about the, the TV side of basketball, you know, because I felt I knew basketball, but you have to know TV also and when to speak and when not to speak. Uh, and, you know, you have a partner on all these games. You know, the Big Ten Network has guys who are, work together or don't you know you work for different networks or you work with different people and you have to get a chemistry going right uh with your partner on air uh and then you you have to deal with the producers and the directors ahead of time here's a story that i think would be great um here's a you know what about this this highlight from this game do we use this um and during the game you know you speak to the producer and the director hey give me the coach here you know or watch out, this is going to be a, a zone trap here, you know, these, so it, it gets, I'm getting probably too much detail here for you, but um, those are all kind of things that people have to learn. You can't just show up as an analyst and think because you know basketball, you're going to do a good job. No, it's great detail. That's the type of stuff that I like to learn about. And um, especially, you know, someone who's, who's called a couple of decades of basketball games like you have. So with that, uh, time you know looking back what are some more memorable games you've called over the years i know you've called a lot of ncaa tournament games uh what are some that stick out to you when you when you reflect you know the the um it's an interesting question uh i did the tournament for about 15 years and uh the ones that stick out are the upsets uh and um we had uh we had bucknell upsetting kansas and uh 
we had Hampton upsetting Iowa State when Iowa State was a two seed out in Boise, Idaho. Um, the Bucknell thing was probably the biggest upset. Uh, you know, Kansas was number one. Uh, Bucknell, they weren't a 16, but they were like a 14 or I don't know what they were, but they were way up there. Uh, and after the game, I'm doing the game with Dick Enberg. And uh, so the producer, we didn't have sideline reporters always. Um, and uh, so the producer says after the game, it's uh, in between games. So we have some time to kill, but we have to get interviews. He says, okay, Dick, go interview the Bucknell coach. And uh, so Dick's going to walk out in front of the table where we always are at half court. He's going to introduce, he's going to interview the Bucknell coach. So I think I don't have anything to do. So the producer says, Bob, go down into the depths of the tunnel and go inter- interview Bill Self. Now, Bill Self just lost to Bucknell, right? <laughs> So I figured, thanks a lot, man. This is a great duty. You have to go down there. I'm not even sure he's going to talk to me, right? Uh, but he did, and he was a gentleman, and it turned out fine. Um, but then I had to rush back because the second game, you know, you do four games in one day. And so it's a lot of work. And uh, so uh, that was probably one of the most memorable ones. Uh, but I've done a lot of games. You know, I, I did a game a couple of years ago for the Big Ten Network that was a, a a big game. Uh, it wasn't a big game in the sense that it was, uh, you know, the top team. But Maryland was playing Penn. Uh, Maryland played Northwestern, and Northwestern was fighting like crazy. They weren't as good. They were right there, and Maryland had two breakaway layups right at the end of the game, and it was just, you know, extremely exciting uh, game. So I've done a, obviously a ton of games over the years, and uh, if if I could sit and talk for hours and hours, I could probably talk about some other games that were very good also but uh the the ones in the ncaa tournament sort of pop out at you you know i did have purdue uh when they had the baby boilermakers when robbie hummel i think was a freshman they had three or four other guys who were freshmen that were really good and they were playing vcu um and vcu uh beat them and uh i had duke when uh VCU beat Duke and Eric Maynard made a shot and my partner at the time was Craig Bolajak and he said dagger and uh, you know Duke lost uh, that game so uh, you know, there's a bunch of them but uh, they're all good uh, it's it's all exciting really yeah all really good stuff and I like the Bill Self anecdote it's never as fun interviewing the loser for sure <laughs> that's right you gotta be careful right exactly uh-huh. tread carefully yeah. um Bob, one more broadcasting question before uh, we talk a little bit about Rutgers to close it out. Who is somebody you've never called a game with that you'd like to call one alongside someday, a, a broadcaster, a play-by-play person, or a, a fellow color commentator as well? Well, I wouldn't do a game with a fellow color commentator, obviously, because we do the same thing, right? Um, yeah, you, so, have, you have the three-man booth sometimes, but yeah, generally, it's, you're right. Yeah, in basketball, not so much, but uh, occasionally you, you have that. Um, I think, um, you know, the guy who was fabulous and I'm thrilled that I got a chance to to work with him was Dick Enberg. I thought he was the greatest broadcaster ever. Um, And uh, I never got a chance to work with um, uh, uh, Vin Scully or, you know, any of those type of people because they were baseball guys and that kind of thing. I've been lucky to, to really have done a, a lot of good work with a, a lot of great people. You know, um, a guy who's in the forefront now who I never worked with when I was at uh, ESPN uh, was Dan Schulman, who I think is very, very good um, and a good guy to work with. But pretty much everybody else at ESPN I worked with, um, all of the uh, guys at Big Ten Network I've worked with, uh, all of the CBS guys I've worked with. Uh, pretty good you know i mean it's um i've been very very fortunate and very lucky uh to to work with a lot of terrific guys and uh you know that Vern lundquist probably you know at cbs and you know he's pretty much out of it now um but i never had a chance to work with him when i was at cbs um and that would that would have been nice the other guy i really liked when i did some he, he used to be at cbs uh and now he's with fox is is um uh <laughs> his name is escaping me right now uh, we did all of the um uh 
the Pac-12 championship games. Sure. And uh, Gus Johnson. Uh, oh, yeah, I guess. Um, Gus had great enthusiasm, you know, and um, he really was a joy to work with because um, he he knew that less was more, um, and but he knew what the big moments were also, and he really had a great way of of calling the big moments. And when that happens, you know, I would just sit out because it was just his voice and then the crowd reaction and the visuals of what the director was doing. Uh, and uh, so I kind of miss where I, I haven't worked with him in some time, but um, yeah, he, he was great. But, but Enberg, I think was, was, was the man. Yeah. Gus uh, is with Fox, like you said, and we hear plenty of him cause he does all the marquee, Big Ten yeah. games now, so we get plenty yeah. of Gus, and the fans almost always love his, you know, like you said, ability to elevate even the biggest moments. So uh, yeah. definitely a yeah. definitely a good choice there. Um, yeah. All right, Bob. Before wrapping up, like I said, I just want to talk a little bit of current Rutgers basketball, and I, to do that, I kind of want to set the stage of why it's so difficult for them to gain much traction historically. So, so why do you think being so close to New York City? <laughs> Yeah, you know, with a lot of uh, recruiting talent in that area, it kind of reminds me of being an Illinois grad. How Illinois struggles to recruit Chicago to a degree. So, why do you think uh-huh. Rutgers struggles uh, just with that geography um, and the situation they're in? I, I think there's been uh, over the years. It's it's not been one thing. It, it's been different things. Some is people. Some is leadership. Right. Um, some is not really knowing your place in the world uh, in terms of where athletics fit into the academic environment. Um, I think there's been some issue with that over the years. Uh, at, at some point, there was facilities issues where they were way, way behind on that. Um, and they've remedied that, you know, because the facilities are really nice now. Um, at one point, there was an issue with uh, television and not getting in the television mix as as strongly as you would want um so some of those things happen because of people or you know the things i've described Uh, i think the other thing is you know you're you're in an area where professional sports are so dominant uh like in chicago um you know where you know you have the football giants and the football jets and you have the hockey teams and you have the baseball teams and college football wasn't much, you know. Um, I mean, really, Penn State, but they're really not in the metropolitan area. So no one really, um, people were into other things, you know. And it was just hard competition for the uh, for the dollar of the, uh, the people wanting to come see games. And uh, so uh, I think there have been a lot of things over the years. But uh, the, the conference affiliation was... Uh, um, a stumbling block for some time, you know, because uh, the Atlantic 10, as good as the league is, is now, uh, at one point, it was way much of a little brother to the Big East, and uh, so that affects your recruiting, you know, I mean, if, if you're going to get kids from that area, um, you know, how do you get them when you have all these other Big East schools, and, and you know, the the New York, New Jersey metropolitan area has been a uh, a place where Duke and Kentucky and all of the the blue blood programs get players over here historically, like from the 1950s even, you know, uh, all the way through. Uh, so it's it's been tough, but I I think now there's a lot of positive signs. Um, I, I know it's not showing that much of, uh, in football right now, um, but uh, I think in basketball, Steve Peichel's doing a good job. Um, he he understands the kind of kids he can get. You know, he's not going to get the top either one and done types, and he's going to get kids that want to be there and and be tough and and play physical. And uh, now that the Big Ten network exists, this is a big positive because there's so many television sets in that part of the world um so financially it's a big deal for rutgers and uh exposure wise it's a big deal uh so uh i I think things are you know finally being in the big 10 conference is the place where rutgers should be uh you know large state universities for the most part um uh, 
other than Northwestern. And, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's, uh, there's a lot of catching up to do, though. There's no doubt about that. Uh, obviously, both football and basketball have been way, way down at the bottom of the standings and so on. Um, but uh, I, I think progress is being made, and it's not going to be easy. Uh, but I mean, even this last week, you know, Rutgers, uh, plays Michigan state, a tight game at home. They go to Wisconsin and really play a tight game at Wisconsin and, you know, Wisconsin really loses at, at the Cole center. So, uh, I, I think they're on the right path, but it, it's been difficult. There's no doubt about that. And I'm not an expert. You know, if you talk to other people about it, they may have other answers, but, as a former player and a, a former coach there, that that's sort of my take on it. Yeah, Steve Peichel's in his third year there. You mentioned you like the direction. He seems to have that program pointed in. And also with the quality of players that they get, you, you mentioned it might be some of the overlooked guys, not the one and dones. What do you like specifically that Peichel gets out of them on the court from a straight X's and O's standpoint from what you've been able to watch of Rutgers? <sighs> Yeah, I think their emphasis is aggression, and uh, you know, the, you can you can be overly aggressive, which last year I thought they were. You know, they've just fouled a lot. You know, I mean, you can look at a stat and say, boy, the field goal percentage is way way down. They're number three or eight or whatever it is in the country. I don't mean Rutgers, but anybody, which is all well and good. But if you're fouling like crazy and people are scoring from the free throw line, that statistic does not necessarily mean you're playing good defense um but i think that they are um they're they're aggressive uh that's the main thing they want to win that's the main thing and uh their uh their skill set is less than some of the teams they're playing again i i against I, I don't think there's any question about that but um you know their their try is there their 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 willingness to work is there uh their they're the type of uh, players that understand they've got to earn everything that they get, you know, that kind of approach. Uh, I don't see much entitlement with, with kids on their team. Um, so uh, at least this year. And uh, so I, I, I think those are some of the things that I look at on the floor. Uh, you know, they're man to man, mostly they're not zone stuff. They pound the boards like crazy. That's where you show effort, right. In rebounding area. Um, the shooting is going to come and go. Um, they were one of the worst teams in the country in three-point shooting last year, and I think they're going to get a little better this year. But that's not a strength. Uh, so uh, those the the effort areas are are what I think they're good at. Yeah, and Pykel obviously has the track record being at Stony Brook for so long, taking them to the uh, the tournament, and he yeah. let's see if he can take Rutgers to where you took them in the early 90s. So, Bob, that's all I got for you. Uh, thanks so much for taking the time. A lot of great stuff, a lot of great stories, I'm sure. We could talk for hours if we were sitting down if we had the time. So uh, I appreciate you jumping on with me today. Well, thank you very much, Alex. It was great talking to you. We'll see you again sometime. Likewise. All right, thanks a lot, to Bob, for joining me. Like I said, it, talking to a person who's been around the game as long as Bob has is always interesting for me. You know, hearing the stories, hearing the people he's crossed paths with, and hearing about the experiences and, and games he's had a front row seat for is all really cool. So shout out to Bob for being very generous with his time. Hope everyone enjoyed it as much as I did. And as we move along here through uh, throughout the winter into college basketball season and, and get past college football, we'll probably have more and more college hoops discussions, hopefully like the one we just had with Bob. So appreciate that. Appreciate everyone out there who listened, who tuned in, and who's downloaded, subscribed, and rated the podcast on uh, all the platforms that we found on. Also appreciate my producers, as always. Wes White and Julie Bronder have done a great job editing the podcast this fall. Uh, Colleen Degnan has done a great job helping produce these episodes. Couldn't do it without them. All right. That'll do it for this episode. We will talk to you next time here on the Take 10 Podcast.